Hello, everyone. This is Space Cafe Podcast, and I am Marcus. Welcome to episode 54 of the Space Cafe Podcast. 54 is, well, not prime, obviously, but enough to allow for some pattern-seeking adventure. I love patterns, by the way. And one pattern in particular stands out. Some of the most successful guests we've had the honor of sharing the studio with based part of their success on the fact that they didn't let hecklers and critics distract them and went their way, even against the toughest headwinds. Some would even go so far as to say that you do not know you're on the right track until someone says that what you were up to is complete nonsense. At least in English. <laughs> Anne Anislund is one of those pioneers. Together with her business partner, they found a solution to a problem that has driven even NASA to despair. A revolutionary propulsion technology that really works and that could change many things up there in orbit. A clear case for a closer look down here at the Space Cafe. What else? Welcome, Anne Anneslund. I am ready. <laughs> I really, I really love your first name and the last name because it seems like it's almost like you crafted it. Anne Anneslund. Sure. So, of course, you didn't craft your own name, but where does it come from? Does it have a meaning? Yes, it has a meaning. It's like uh, it, in Norwegian we say Ornesland, mm -hmm. and Ornes is a name, so it's the land of Ornes. Interesting. So now in English, when we say Ornesland, it's my land. <laughs> <laughs> so you have your own land already in your name. So you're, yep. you're free spirit. So my name is Anna Ornesland. I'm uh, from Norway and uh, a physicist of origin. And now I live mm -hmm. in France for the last 15 years. And I created, um, together with my co-founder, uh, Trust Me, five years ago. And Trust Me is a deep tech uh, engineering company in the space industry. And we develop uh, cool. very innovative space propulsion systems. You're a physicist by origin. How far back is that origin? It feels like a lifetime ago, but it's only five years ago. <laughs> so five years ago, I was a physicist and researcher at a mm -hmm. research lab in, here in France. But uh, now I'm a CEO and uh, no longer a physicist in, in work. But of course, it's part of my DNA. Do you miss being a physicist? Not at all. I very much enjoy uh, what I'm doing now. I'm not okay. the person that normally <laughs> misses stuff. So just very briefly, you um, developed a new kind of propellant, um, to put that in very layperson's terms, for satellites. So to, to get us going, how do satellites maneuver in space at the moment? So the traditional way, and it's still the same way as what we do, is to use propulsion. So you, you, you move a spacecraft or you change the velocity of a satellite by expelling uh, matter, the, mm -hmm. the propellant. Mm -hmm. um, and the better you do it, the more efficient you accelerate this propellant out, the less propellant you need to bring with you mm -hmm. to, to do the same change in, in the orbit. Mm -hmm. So that's the basic principle of the propulsion. And now to do it very efficiently and to accelerate particles to very high velocities, normally you need gases or plasmas to accelerate charged particles. Mm -hmm. So in the past, we used gases to do that. Gases that are easy to do this ionization and accelerate these particles. Mm -hmm. What we do at Trust Me is to use a solid propellant. So it's, an, uh, it's iodine. So it's it's uh, is, is it is it the iodine we usually ingest um, against uh, nuclear fallout issues? Exactly, 
exactly. Wow. So if if there is a nuclear fallout, you should come to trust me and get saved. <laughs> um, so so you could either propel a satellite or save my health from a nuclear fallout. Yeah, like or you can bring it with you when you are in the <laughs> in the forest and you have to drink water that is uh, not clean. So then we also <laughs> use iodine. Um, so iodine is this crystals. It's the same. Mm -hmm. It's similar to salt, table salt. But what is magic about it is that when you apply a little bit of heat, it can sublimate directly to gas. So it mm. doesn't go through the liquid phase. You know, when mm. you have the, the different states of matter, sure. you have yeah. a solid, you heat it up and you bring energy and it becomes a liquid. And you heat it up and you, it becomes a gas. And now iodine is so magical because you apply a little bit of heat and it sublimates directly to gas. Hmm. So there is, there is no way to come up with liquid iodine. Yes, you can do that as well, you but you that. need yeah. But then you need to match the the pressure and okay. the temperature. So you okay. can also use liquid. And the whole game is to avoid using the liquid because liquid ah. iodine is no good. Okay. At least for our use cases. Okay. So then you have a gas when you have heated it up, which means that you can use all of the traditional technologies in space that used gases before. Hmm. And that is what is so good about it, because you can do use a solid on ground, which means that it's a passive system. You can ship it by plane. There is no mm -hmm. pressurized gases that are in big uh containers uh, containing a high pressure and a mm -hmm. high pressure means explosion risk and mm -hmm. it means expensive systems and Ooh, difficult fashion. to ship mm -hmm. so now you have a solid it's like you are taking your table salt and you ship it uh, by plane it's no risk by that hmm. and it's the same uh, on the launcher there is no mm -hmm. risk uh, launching this system to space and then fashion. when it is in space It operates and it performs like in the traditional, very good uh, systems and very efficient system. When did you come up with that idea in the first place? Um, so we are not the first one to come up with this idea. Uh, using iodine was a dream in, the, in, in our field for many, many years from the 60s mm -hmm. because it was such an ideal propellant. Mm -hmm. But in the 60s, it was too difficult to use this uh, matter on ground because it's also a corrosive matter. Mm -hmm. so, so it was abandoned for a while. And then mm -hmm. uh, when I started working uh, here in, in France as a researcher, we had other innovative ideas of space propulsion. And one of them was um, to use iodine but not mm -hmm. in the way we do it at Trustman. Mm -hmm. It was much more complex and much more fundamental physics. We shouldn't go into it today, but mm -hmm. it was really uh, fundamental research at that time. Uh, and then uh, when my co-founder, Dimitro uh, Rafalski, came uh, and joined me, uh, that's when we started really looking at this propellant for the traditional space industry. And, and uh, we started developing the products for that. You know what? I'm, I'm really keen on trying to find out how you, maybe a lone researcher in Norway, can come up with a solution to something that NASA abandoned. How is that possible? Are you a genius? Of course I'm you not are. A, <laughs> I'm, I'm not at all a genius, and, and I should not take too much of this credit <laughs> because the, it's the it's the team at Trust Me, and especially our CTO Dimitro and the rest mm. of the technical team that made this happen. Mm -hmm. um, one thing is to come up with an idea; another sure. thing is to make it happen. And I think they did a significant work on that. And maybe But, also the boldness to pursue on such an endeavor to say, exactly. let's do it. I think this is a, a big part of, of something yeah. like this. Let's do it. Uh, push down the walls when people tell you it will never happen. Mm. It will never work. You will never make it happen. Because that mm -hmm. we heard a lot, like anybody mm -hmm. that tried to do outside of uh, mm -hmm. the standard mainstream. 
Um, I think what we have done at Trust Me is really to go back to the basic principles of physics and engineering. And that's why we mm -hmm. managed to make it happen before the others. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So tell me a little bit, before we talk about the actual um, technology, tell me a little bit about the research. Um, I guess it took a couple of years to come up with a solution. I could imagine that this involves quite a bit of um, loneliness also as a researcher. Um, loneliness in the lab, friction with colleagues, because it's really tough to come up with solutions. So what is life like? And don't, yeah. pay, don't paint a romantic picture. <laughs> um, I will not be, I'm not a I'm romantic person, but my <laughs> husband is more romantic. Um, so, yes, of course, it's a bit lonely. Um, it's not lonely alone because actually to make it happen, you are a team. And this mm -hmm. has always been a teamwork uh, and a very strong teamwork. Uh, so uh, there is no picture of me alone in a lab trying to do sure. something that doesn't exist. Probably more, uh, our city, Dimitro had more these lonely times in the lab making it work because mm -hmm. he's the technical person behind the, mm -hmm. the work while I was more and is still more the one that is uh, yeah making everything else work around it mm -hmm. but for fixing technical solutions I think that's more uh, not not my my part of it anyway it's yes it is a little bit lonely together mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because you have to speak with people that don't believe and and also that have tried other things before and have not succeeded in the past and why should you be bold enough to think that you will manage something other people didn't do mm -hmm. without being too too it's not that we are smarter because we are mm -hmm. not smarter mm -hmm. uh, i don't believe so we have we have education of course we have higher education like anybody else in the space industry Uh, what we did was to think differently. And in, to in what kind? In, in, how? how different? So if we look at... Um, now you have this very innovative propellant that I explained, with, mm -hmm. which is a solid. Mm -hmm. And it's not a pressurized system. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't just replace this solid with... Let's say that you have your whole system and you have a pressurized tank. You have all the valves mm -hmm. that goes through the thruster itself. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of complex things. You can't just take this part and replace it and re-engineer around it. Mm -hmm. You have to start doing the basic principles of propulsion and say, how can mm -hmm. we use this new propellant and integrate mm -hmm. it in another way to use it mm -hmm. in the best way possible? So is this like um, um, Elon Musk's first principle thinking? Yes, he's very famous for this first principle yeah. thinking. Uh, I think this is the basics of physics. Okay. So, and I, a physicist will do the basic first principle thinking. That's how mm -hmm. we uh, create new knowledge. And, mm -hmm. and uh, when we started working with iodine, There is a lot of new knowledge to create because there is not a lot of literature behind how iodine reacts with the different sur surfaces. So, mm -hmm. so you have to do a surface study. There is no uh, studies on how it will be ionized. And there are many, many technologies and physics and chemistry and materials that you have to actually develop. So that was Down truly the, pi pi pioneering work. Yeah, it's pioneering. It's really research back to create knowledge. And you have to couple that with engineering work to make it work and make it a product because that's two huh. different things. A physicist you, is very good mm -hmm. in asking questions and, mm -hmm. and maybe getting a solution, but the engineers are there to make it work and make it happen. And, and come up with answers. So what's your secret sauce to making people support that project to find people to not oppose and, and and say the usual thing that's not going to happen that's impossible nasa couldn't do it why should you do it so what's your secret sauce behind it i think 
we are all a little bit optimistic and naive in a way that mm -hmm. we we and everybody that we recruit have this open mindedness so you can mm -hmm. see that it's a very diverse team but the common point with all all the people we recruit are that they are very very curious and they have moved uh, countries and continents before they are not scared of mm -hmm. uh, being outside of their comfort zone it's actually their comfort zone hmm. and this makes you curious about other things and therefore you can work with people that know other things that you do and that's how you can get a, a teamwork uh, to make things happen i found a, a team photo of your company on the internet and what stood out to me was the atmosphere the that team radiated in, into my direction it, it seems like they l like working with one another that photo has a true team spirit yeah i think teamwork is and the team spirit and and what that means is that you have uh you have you have to trust each other mm -hmm. and you have to believe in each other it doesn't mean that you need to be agreeing all the time or that it's all the time pleasant sure. But actually, good teamwork is when you can dare to not agree and you can dare mm. to be yourself and think in the way you think and accept the other ones to do the same thing. Hmm. I like that. So it's um, you allow yourself to be open because the others are open. So it's um, a team of trust held together by trust. And I think yeah. this is... And, and trust means... It's okay to make failures because by making failures, we learn, maybe. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And it's okay to say, I'm not so strong in this part. Can you help me? Mm -hmm. Or nice. I'm blocked here. Or this nice. is my weak spot. Or here I'm strong. And it's also good to say, I'm good at that part. I can mm -hmm. do it. So at some point, um, after meticulous work, and lonely hours in the lab, at some point you decided you have something that could work. What next? So Dimitra and I, we actually um, came up with, the, we started working on miniaturization of propulsion in 2014. Before that, we had worked on other topics uh, together since 2011. So we worked quite a long time together. And we were at a conference um, in the US in 2014 or 15, and we listened to the, the large corporates speaking about the new space and how they would uh, tackle the situation. And we realized that we had something. We had something that we could do uh, to improve and to help the industry. And then we went back uh, and started our first business plan on a sh sheet mm -hmm. of paper and said, we can do something like this. Uh, and then it's, uh, you start to have to get other people with you. You have to mm -hmm. uh, get funding to recruit engineers. Uh, in, the, in the past, you would recruit physicists for PhDs, and now we not need to recruit engineers. And you have to set up and prepare uh, to spin out this technology into a startup if that was what mm -hmm. we wanted to do. So in the beginning, it was really to find out the strategy. Are we going mm -hmm. to work with a big corporate? Are we going to mm -hmm. uh, get a research contract and continue R&D? Are we going to do a spin-out to a startup? And finally, we decided to do the spin-out because it's really exciting. And we got mm -hmm. really, uh, and we have something um, to bring to the, to the industry. Mm -hmm. And it took us, um, up to 2017 to create the company. So was was the industry waiting, desperately waiting for your development, for your invention, or were you facing unexpected opposition and disbelief in the in the beginning? In the beginning, actually, what is funny is that when we came and started talking with the, with the potential clients. They would tell us that they would never use electric propulsion because they didn't have the power enough on the satellite mm -hmm. or the satellite was too small or, mm -hmm. or many other, uh, we don't need propulsion. And we continue and said, 
this will never continue. They will change their mind because it doesn't make sense. Uh, and their power budget will be higher and they will need a better deployment of their constellation. So it's for sure that every single satellite will need propulsion on board to be economically sustainable. Mm -hmm. doesn't make sense if not. And also to have a sustainable use of space, you need propulsion mm -hmm. on board. So we continued and when our products were uh, finished and ready, uh, then also the industry is ready. So we are really in the good timing. Hmm. Fascinating. But um, it seems like uh, in the beginning, if you're onto something, expect pushback. Um, this is what what also was so true for you. So yeah, if there's true. pushback, you know, maybe we're on the right track. Yeah, true. Nice, nice, nice. So, okay. I take now, always that as a compliment when people don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. By the way, um, with that new thruster technology, were you approaching primarily European industries, European partners, or were you pushing for all over the place and finding out who would be the right partner? Or, or was Europe the first target? Yeah, that's a very good question. And it's a quite interesting answer I have to give because what we were looking for was the innovators in the satellite manufacturing industry. Uh, those that are ready to go first. Because mm -hmm. when we are coming with a new product, it's always a risk. And you can never assure enough saying it's going to work because you can't mm -hmm. say that. Uh, because it's not sure that it's going to work. And it's not sure that it's safe for your satellite before you have tested it. So when we speak with the European actors, uh, what is the typical um, feedback is, it's extremely interesting. We want to do it. Let's do an application to ESA and get funding and da 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 da. And it would be maybe two years before we would have anything in space. So the mm. European actors were just definitely interested, but too slow in the movement. They wouldn't take action and the risk themselves as a commercial ac action. Uh, for the Americans, it was a little bit similar. Why should they do it when Europeans don't? Hmm. While the Chinese are much more in the innovative uh, moment now, it really moves quite company space, uh, space T. Uh, uh, for the first two missions uh, because they were ready uh, to do innovation and they were ready to take the risk. It, it comes with uh, the big achievements if it goes well. So they were not afraid. And it was really uh, something very interesting to observe because the Europeans were just too afraid to, to innovate quickly enough. To work with the Chinese <clears throat> because from... Very often you hear that China would then use that as a a way to bring technologies for their own needs. You were there any issues with that? Were you were you thinking, hey, should we do that? Should we shouldn't we do it? Will they t in their own hands and 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 take it away from us? Yeah, of course you have to be very very careful in such a move. I think it would be the same if we went to the US or the same mm -hmm. if uh, we went to... You have to be very careful for copying uh, such an innovative uh, product. Mm -hmm. um, we got a lot of support from uh, the French state uh, to mm -hmm. to help us in uh, towards working with, uh, with China and the Chinese actors. And we also chose very carefully the first client in, in China. Mm -hmm. So Space T, for example, have no uh, uh, office in Luxembourg. So now it is a European uh, Chinese company. Mm -hmm. And the culture in that company is understanding the Western culture. Mm -hmm. the, the discussions with them are less complicated than we try to do with some others that are very, very Chinese where language became a barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, while with Space T, it was not really a language barrier, maybe also a little bit of a culture barrier, but um, there were many people um, 
in that company in China that had been a way for their studies in in either Europe or in Canada. And that helped us a lot, and 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 we still have a very good co collaboration with them. So, what what was the first cooperation with China like? So, they helped you test that thruster technology in actual space. Yeah. So, we have two different technologies using iodine at the moment, and we have different uh, technologies that we are developing and products that are coming up uh, in the near future. But the first uh, technology that we tested was in 2019. It's a, it's a, called a, a coal gas thruster with iodine. It's the simplest system that you can find now on the, mm -hmm. on the market. And for Space T, that was not of their interest because their platforms mm -hmm. are bigger and they need something mm -hmm. more performant. Mm -hmm. But it was the leading up to our next much higher performance system that they would need for their constellation. So it was a win-win. The first one was for us to test the, demo, um, the technology and make sure that it works. And the second was to test the technology and a product that they would be interested in after. So mm -hmm. it's really a win-win um, a collaboration of demonstrating technologies that the industry and mm -hmm. they would need later. Mm -hmm. So Thrust Me is your company name, the, the brand name of your um, proprietary technology. By the way, who came up with that brilliant name? This is genius. <laughs> Seriously, Thrust Me. Can't get any better. Thank you. Um, so I came up with that idea. And, uh, <laughs> so you are a I, genius. <laughs> thank you. And okay. uh, I, I came and asked uh, first, Dimitro, what do you think about that name? We had many other names and every time, every day we came with new names and, uh, <laughs> and no, no. And then I said, Diva, what do you think about, uh, trust me, brilliant. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and then I started Googling it and we realized that, hmm, it's maybe a bit difficult to call, a, call that company mm -hmm. this because of the sexual connotation in English. Mm -hmm. And then I called my brother-in-law, which is mm -hmm. uh, uh, American, and I asked mm -hmm. him, can I call the company Trust Me? And he, he's also like, <laughs> no, I'm no. crazy. <laughs> no. And yeah, but is it very, very bad or is it pink? <laughs> and it's pink. <laughs> and, okay, that is done. We call it uh, Great. This. Great. That's but really still brilliant. Some, yeah, sometimes it's a bit complicated, but uh, we see that some some journalists have a problem writing our name in the title, but yeah. that's okay. Yeah. Sometimes it's um, beneficial if there's a little bit of um, talk about something, like a brand name. It's um, yeah. It's beneficial sometimes. Yeah. So it's deliberate, absolutely. It's not yes, something that yes. we did without knowing. Nicely, nicely played, nicely played. <laughs> so, um, so how can I, as a layperson, imagine uh, your technology? So, for example, um, I could imagine if I had a regular thruster, rocket thruster, a miniature version right next to me on my table, and I would turn it on, I would immediately see... The results, it would burn down my table and would burn down my house and whatnot. What would happen if I activated your thrust me drive right next to me on the table? Nothing, it wouldn't work. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. uh, because uh, for these uh, very high in orbit propulsion systems, you need vacuum for them to work. So you need mm. a big vacuum chamber uh, for it mm -hmm. to actually turn on. So it mm -hmm. wouldn't turn on, it would just uh, burn its own elect uh, electronic cir circuit and be destroyed. Okay. Okay. So you so, would be very disappointed. <laughs> okay. Yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> So, but but this is this is kind of interesting because how can you demo something like this on Earth to get investment? Yeah, so we have uh, so our labs are quite uh, impressive because we have big big vacuum chambers to okay. to test these systems in space uh, or, or simulate them uh, and test them and develop them. What is interesting uh, with our uh, technology and the use of iodine is that the 
pumping systems to make big this vacuum and the vacuum chambers are not the same uh, as when you use gaseous uh, systems. You cannot use the same pumps to, mm-hmm. to make vacuum. Uh, so this is something we had to also study a lot and master and uh, to to deal with this uh, technology mm-hmm. and develop it. Are those drives as powerful as traditional uh, gaseous drives in space? So would the acceleration be the same or would, would it be different? Yeah, what we showed with our... Uh, demonstration in space is that it's actually giving better performances than the classical system. So it's so your space you, Tesla. So it's a space Tesla. It's even better and uh, <laughs> and better for the planet and better for the operations. In how far is it better? Yeah, so it's if we compare it with the classical xenon systems, mm-hmm. it's slightly better. Mm-hmm. measurably better but not a factor of two better it's it's mm-hmm. just a little bit better mm-hmm. um, but when it comes to krypton which Elon Musk is using on the Starlink mm-hmm. uh, you need two times more power uh, to generate the same force mm-hmm. so that is significantly better it's two times mm-hmm. more and also the iodine stores nine times denser than Krypton. So if we compare to the mm. Starlink uh, satellites. Uh, so the space that you will gain and also the cost of the iodine uh, is significantly better. So iodine is around 50 euro per kilo, even below if you mm. buy a lot. Uh, while Xenon before the 24th of uh, February was... Uh, 2,500 uh, euro a kilo. Hmm. So iodine is only 2% the cost. And since the so, war in Ukraine, uh, yeah. and the xenon prices have tripled. Wow. Wow. This sounds like almost too good to be true. Are you a very true? rich person now? Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's uh, you know, when you do groundbreaking innovation, which I think mm-hmm. this is, um the advantages are many uh because mm-hmm. it's so groundbreaking and it's it's uh and it's not easy to make we still have mm-hmm. a long way to go uh at the moment we have products uh that have uh low power uh, mm-hmm. uh use so it's for the smaller satellites uh the next step is to develop uh systems for bigger platforms and there is definitely more r and d to do and and uh things mm-hmm. to to cover would that be something to seriously consider for manned missions um for example mars missions um would that be something that um, elon could be interested or whoever is going to mars going to these mars. days um so is that something so for when you go to mars um for the crew for the persons you need to do it quicker and then you need chemical propulsion or, or, okay. or much higher uh, system, a higher force to, to move faster. But for all of the cargo that will go there, and all the systems and all the materials and, and the stuff can use more time. And it's definitely using electric propulsion. And it's definitely using iodine because mm-hmm. uh, there is no xenon or krypton that we should really send so much out there because we need it here on the ground. I still like the idea that um, I could get the iodine tablets um, in my pharmacy and um, at the same time drive your um, ingenious thrusters um, to go from wherever I want to go. So that's yeah. that's pretty cool. So it's very sustainable. True. It's so very, very sustainable. sustainable. <laughs> um, so tell me uh, that moment when, for the first time, your technology, your thrust me drive, was in in space in orbit, and you hit the activate thrust now button. How was that? Tell me that moment. It's. Uh... Yes, yeah, so we, we did the launch in, in, uh, from China during the mm-hmm. COVID uh, period. So we couldn't mm-hmm. even 
be there to integrate mm -hmm. and help uh, Space T to, to integrate. So everything was a bit uh, of uh, stress because we, we did all the information uh, via uh, Zoom or other mm -hmm. applications. Uh, and we also made video recordings. Uh, so we were mm -hmm. make, made sure uh, that uh, they didn't have to be lost in translation by reading. So we did a <laughs> lot of videos to, to make sure that they integrated the system properly. Uh, and then uh, when it launched, of course, we couldn't be there at the launch. So we got uh, video streams from China to see it. Uh, it's quite, uh, quite. Uh, it's nerve wracking, isn't it? It's, it's I mean, like it's your baby on board. Yeah. Um, so yeah. so that's that's a stressful period, <laughs> and then you have to wait because then mm. it's all the commissioning of the satellite, and you don't know exactly mm. when it's your turn. Um, and suddenly you get a phone call and said, "Okay, you have to be ready," and it can be a Sunday morning or. Or uh, and I think for us it was a Sunday morning when uh, when we should first uh, fire it up and uh, we yeah it's quite a uh, and everything worked as James Webb uh, to me James Webb is the new standard for perfection so it yeah worked that's crazy <laughs> just the way uh, James Webb was working so everything worked as what we expected not everything it was a still a, a tech demonstration so. Mm -hmm. um, We learned a lot from that mission and uh, mm -hmm. we, uh, according to all the success criteria that we had defined beforehand, it outperformed uh, what we expected wow. from this mission. Wow. Uh, but there is still a lot of things to develop and a lot of things to improve, of course. It's, it's the first demonstration. And now we have uh, different systems in space uh, and we are delivering to clients and we still continue improving uh, the system. I think you never end uh, improving mm -hmm. a system. It's a continuous process. Wow. And how do you motivate yourself to move on? I mean, like, um, it seems Good like question. this is, this is, you already mentioned, it's, a, it's a, sometimes very stressful, sometimes very lonely, sometimes um, <clears throat> maybe you're doubting um, if you're on the right track, but it seems like you're always making the right decision. So how, uh, what's your secret sauce? How do you motivate yourself to move on? That's a good question. D did, are you doing sport? Did you, did you, are yes, you a I do, player? Yes, yes, yes. I do so, ultra running, mountain running. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. So I'm a bit too, so, but yeah. not ultra. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, so I've always been a very competitive person. I did a lot of uh, athleticism when I was young, and I'm used to compete. And, and I think uh, competition is healthy competition is always a good motivation. Mm -hmm. And you can compete with yourself or you can compete with others. But to have some goals of reaching and competing against your own performances, mm -hmm. or uh, we should admit that uh, having working towards the first uh, test of iodine system in space. Um, and we knew that there were other people uh, on the planet working on it as well. Of course, it gives a drive to push further and faster. Mm. Uh, it's always uh, good to have good and healthy competition. Hmm. What would you tell to all those who are not into sports and still want to be uh, a, a good engineer, a good physicist, a good... <clears throat> inventor of new technologies. I think those are even more, they have to compete <laughs> in this field. <laughs> so, so I think we all find, well, either you have your competitive edge and, and mm -hmm. drive, um, or you will not do it because yeah. there is no reason. So I yeah. think everybody that really push through and work hard, it's for to, to demonstrate something. And it's to demonstrate something for yourself or to others. And mm -hmm. for example, when you hear uh, in 2008, when we, when I first spoke about iodine in, in and to mm -hmm. use iodine in space, the comments I got were, oh, very interesting physics, but this will never work. It will never happen. Mm -hmm. And this wish to show them wrong is a very strong drive. 
and other people can take it as a um as a pushback and say okay maybe i should listen mm -hmm. to them mm -hmm. and i unfortunately have this thing of i will prove them wrong very strongly <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is good and it's also sometimes I have to work on that too I admit that maybe they were right this time <laughs> Is your family proud of you I guess? A, a tough mom pushing frontiers? Yes but I think also it's my role to be proud of my kids and not the, the, mm -hmm. the opposite way around but of course What else in, in Anne's world that is not space related? What is it that you love doing? You said it's sports. D do you permanently watch space movies, science fiction movies, because this is your world? No, not yes and no. I like, yeah, science fiction movies for, are, are cool. Um, um, what I like to do is to be out there. Uh, and to mm, be in the mm -hmm. mountains or, or, yeah. So now next week I'm going up in the Arctic uh, for an exploration uh, with my wow. family. So this is what I like to do when I'm, I'm not doing uh, the space. Wow, fascinating. So you're, is this like a, um, an outdoor experience? You're, yes, you're, I would, uh, for example, last week I went camping in the forests uh, with the tent and backpacks. Um, But it's winter. Even if I live in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> so you can do that not so far from Paris. But yeah, it's, it's okay. uh, nice to be outside in the, in the forest. Or in the mountains or on the ocean. So it, this is the maybe your way to ground yourself and, and to balance, balance your life out from very tough uh, work, um, uh, leading a company and to give to recharge your own batteries, I guess. Yes, for sure. And every, I think uh, every year, um, I'm I'm really a fan of taking really uh, getting off the grid, but really off the grid. So hmm. turning off the phone, uh, turning off the electricity, uh, wow. water, and be ten days on auto sufficiency in the mountains with the family, where you bring wow. everything with you, and you. So we normally go. Uh, in the Arctic uh, once a year, we can cross uh, 150 kilometers on ski and pulling uh, 40 kilos of weight behind us uh, wow. to get to just be. <laughs> and how, how do, I mean, seriously, the how, mega constellations have, are not there yet, yeah. so we don't have phone <laughs> connections. <laughs> we can't reach us. Not yet, not yet. Um, <laughs> not yet. But how? How do you motivate your kids to come along? I mean, seriously, I have two daughters. They would never, <laughs> ever come along in something like this. Uh, they were 18 months the first time we brought them okay. in the camp. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't know anything different. So they are used really? to that. And you know, when you see kids, uh, when they are very small, they have, no. Uh, at least mine are very, very active. So they would never stop and they are twins. So you have no, you you have to make them do sport because if not you will just go insane in a small apartment in Paris so so you have to train <laughs> so they get used to it resilience <laughs> yes <laughs> speaking of kids what would you tell young adults why this, the space industry is a fascinating place to work I think uh, so young adults or very young kids uh, or any is that uh, it's extremely fascinating because there are so many domains that need to be covered. So you can always find uh, a place in the space industry where you have something uh, that you can bring. Either it's because you are very good in engineering, but there is not only engineering. It's, it's physics, it's materials, you have humans. Uh, you need to run the businesses, you need finance. Mm -hmm. So you don't need only to have the hard sciences to be um, mm -hmm. in the space. But another thing that we should also keep in mind is that the hard sciences is a very bad word because it looks like it's very tough. And we mm -hmm. tend to use these words that makes us scared uh, of this uh, Of the, yeah, the usual of triggers, math and physics, and I'm yeah. not good enough, and uh, yeah, yeah, and we and we get scared of them, and and uh, and 
I can see that sometimes in, in social settings that when you say that you are a physicist, people get a bit scared of you. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this is something that we need to break down because I don't think we are that much smarter. That's good to hear. I guess I guess you were pretty smart at school in math and physics, but um, what were you not so good at? I'm um, I'm a uh, very strong dyslexic person, so <laughs> I could not read and write before I was uh, 10 years old. Wow, interesting. So I had to do everything by memory, so the teacher didn't discover wow. it. <laughs> so, wow. So I had to, to memorize most of the text until I was uh, 10 years because I was too slow in reading it uh, when it was my turn to read. Wow. So what you're saying is that the space industry is looking for any kind of expertise. So even if you're not really like super excelling at math and physics and the, the, the typical... Um, disciplines you would connect with the space industry, there is still a place for you because if you can do something in the in the social sciences, for example, there will be a place for you in the space industry. Yeah, I think so. Of course, there is a dominance of engineers and physicists sure. and you need to like to work with these kind of people. Sure. Uh, but there is always a need for a diversity. And I think it will come more and more uh, what you can see in other sectors as well. What is it like to work in Europe um, as opposed to the United States, as opposed to China? I don't know. I've not been long enough working in the US or in China to really have the experience. But what you can see is that I think we have a stronger work-life balance. In a startup, that is maybe not the truth, but, <laughs> uh, but in general, it's the truth that we have a better work-life balance. Mm-hmm. Good. It's good to hear. So what, what up next in, in Anne's, Anne Lund's world? So what's, what up next in your Trust yeah, Me world? Yes. Yeah, so it's a quite exciting time at Trust Me because now we have started uh, the industrialization. Uh, so we have uh, just started renting our next door building uh, to set up the, the whole infrastructure for industrialization and the production line. Um, we have just recruited our head of production. We have recruited a CFO and now we are recruiting uh, <coughs> up to 15, 15 people this year. Uh, so now we are growing uh, and it's, it's the next step of, uh, of the company where we are serving clients uh, internationally. So it's an interesting uh, period from going period. to from R&D and product development. And now it's really in the uh, industrialization and delivery to clients Wonderful. while we keep Wonderful. also developing other products and, and the next products that comes to other markets. Cool. Is there a secret product you would like to talk about? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, and you, you know what my, since you just mentioned that you, um, listening to a space cafe podcast while running you know what the last question is yes and no. the last the last question is the one about coffee um do you drink coffee i drink far too much coffee <laughs> good 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 um because the last question is all about the space cafe espresso and yeah. that would be um your inspiration your espresso for the mind you would like to share um with me with the audience, when it comes to something off the top of your head, um, you think is inspiring to audiences and could inspire audiences out there to lead better lives in the future, either personally or socially or whatnot. You can pick any kind of topic. Any kind of topic. So I think... Um It's maybe not to live better lives, but uh, m many of my heroes are explorers from to, to the Arctic and the Antarctic. And uh, during the COVID time, we had a Norwegian and a um, South uh, African person going crossing the North Pole uh, on skis during night. And to be able to cross the North Pole, What they had to do was to change their rhythm 
uh, the 24 day rhythm to 27 day, uh, mm-hmm. 27 hours instead of 24 hours to be able to cope with the sliding of the ice, uh, while they walk. Ah. So they walked and the ice would slide, uh, slide while they slept. So to be able to do it, they had to, uh, create 27 hour stays. Huh. And this is what I'm dreaming of now because in startups, we never have enough hours in a day. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) So so the result is that we should have 27 hours days instead of 24 and we can do much better. Wonderful. Wonderful. (laughs) Thank you so much. uh, And for that um, very inspiring conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you for having me. It's never too late to dare doing what was previously deemed impossible. Times change and so does the potential for solutions. What an inspiring message to get us through times of frustration and despair. Yes, these are the very words we should unabashedly say more often. Life can be hard and frustrating and perhaps most of the time it is. But those brief moments of triumph after Overcoming a big problem are worth every second, right? Thank you for spending your valuable time with us today. Stay tuned. Bye-bye.